Our Father, we realize we need thy help. And the Lord, without the aid of thy spirit, Lord, this word would just fall down. But, O oh God, I pray that thou will take it by thy Holy Spirit. And thou will apply it to our hearts. Open our hearts, Lord. And stop our ears and pray for the deep work of the Spirit wrong in this meeting for the glory of King Jesus. And so I take the promised Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. the blessed power of Pentecost, to fill me now, my yielded being, body, soul, and spirit, totally to thee. I take thee, and I just mm -hmm. undertake in Jesus' name. Amen. Returning to Isaiah chapter 41. And verse 10, Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10, and we're going to commence to read from that beautiful promise and covenant from the Lord for his children. He said, Fear thy not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them, and shalt not find them, even them that contended with thee. They that war against thee shall be as nothing, and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thy worm, Jacob. <coughs> ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small, and shalt make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. Amen. And God will bless the public reading of his word. I want to speak to you this evening on the covenant of change. The covenant of change. Isaiah the prophet lived in Jerusalem. And he was one of those prophets that foretold the events that would ultimately happen and come upon Israel for her disobedience. At this particular period in his prophecy in around the 40th chapter, He's commencing to see into the future. And God in his wonderful providence and sovereignty permits his child to see at least 150 years into the future. And there the Lord shows him and he's, he's laying it before this servant of God that, that Jerusalem would be saved from Assyria who would take the northern kingdom. But ultimately that she would then fall to Babylon and go into exile. Then Babylon would fall and Cyrus the Persian would take over. And then there would be a small remnant that would return home to Jerusalem. And he's speaking to this remnant. These ones that are left and that are coming back. And in their weakness. And in their frailty. It's a word in chapter 41 of great encouragement. And in these days in the Lord's work. Those who are doing the Lord's will. They need encouragement. And we need the ministry of Barnabas. And more importantly the ministry of the Lord Jesus, for he wouldn't leave the flax broken. The Lord would always encourage. That's always the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know, so often here in Ulster, we're accustomed to the brutality of the church and the brutality of comments 
and criticisms that are passed by people that are not spiritual. But when the Holy Ghost is ministering through a man or through a group of people or through a woman, there is always the ministry of encouragement. The Holy Spirit works very tenderly. I've always found in life's experience, no matter what they were, that when the Holy Spirit ministered to me, he always came tenderly. And there was a sweetness about him. And of course, that's just the nature of the Lord Jesus. Well, this word of encouragement is coming from the prophet Isaiah and he says to them, I want to just take two verses or three tonight, very briefly in verse 14, he commences to this little group that are going to return and he says, fear not thou worm Jacob. I want you to notice the company that he addresses. Now, this particular word men, where he says the men of Israel, means a few men. This was a small remnant that would return, and ultimately did return a small remnant. It means a diminutive group. It means those who are weak. And the prophet is addressing them and he says, not only are they men, few in number, but he says, thou worm. A worm is something that is contemptible. Did you ever see anything as weak or helpless as a worm? Did you ever see anything that had such lack of ability and couldn't threaten or intimidate his enemies so vulnerable as a worm? And the Lord said, Jacob, Israel, Zion, you are a worm company. And in these days in which we live, I believe that the Lord wants to raise up another group of worms. Because you must become a worm before God can use you. The Lord Jesus said when prophesying Psalm 22, the psalmist said, I am a worm and no man. The Lord Jesus had a humble spirit, a gentle spirit. The Lord Jesus never needed to apologize. The Lord Jesus never trumped over anybody. In Ulster, something I have noticed in recent months that God has been showing me in my spirit is that there's something abroad in the church in Ulster that is not of God but is regarded as being of God and spiritual and it's not. And it's a brutality, a brutality in relation to dealing with the things of God and the people of God and it's not of the spirit of God. Yes, truth must be preached. Righteousness must be upheld. But by the Spirit of God. A humble spirit. Martin Luther said, God creates out of nothing. Therefore, until a man is nothing, God can make nothing out of him. Are you nothing? Or are you something? If we're still something, God can't create anything yet. You see, the choice presented was to be a worm filled with the Spirit. Or to be in Ulster's terminology, a bull full of the flesh. And as I was meditating on this today and praying and seeking the Lord, the Lord was saying to me, that's what I want you to be like. I want you to be a worm, full of the Holy Spirit. I don't want you to be a bull in the house of God and with the people of God, controlled and dominated by the flesh. That's the company that God's going to use. God said, fear not thou worm Jacob. The worm speaks 
of that which would steadily move on humble ground. The worm will perpetually dig a little and graft its way slowly through. And the Lord said, Thou worm, Jacob. Jacob was the man who grafted that night at Peniel, the man who wrestled with God, the man who interceded, the man who became Israel, the man who was changed by God because he was an intercessor. He was a man of prayer. He was transformed in prayer. And brothers and sisters, that's what the worm speaks of. And the man or woman who is mighty in prayer and mighty in the Holy Ghost will not need to work like a bull. Because the Lord God of Israel will work with them. The company. I want you to see the necessity. The Lord said, Fear thou not, not thy worm, Jacob. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument. God says, I'm going to make something new. Something new. And I believe with all my heart in, in the nation and the land tonight that that's exactly what God is doing. I believe that with all my heart. That God, because of necessity, God is raising up something new. This word new means something fresh. Now why did God out of his people Israel require something fresh? Why did God need something new? Because of the uniqueness of the situation. I'm not much into computers. I have one that's very helpful for study sometimes. Sometimes it's a plague. And that I can't get it on, can't get it off, but that's besides the point. But I had to bring it recently. A fellow brought it for me down to get what they call a health check. And when we went down and looked at this fellow and he fiddled at it, and he didn't seem to know much about it no more than I did, but he was supposed to be paid to do this, and he went through it and he said, you know, here's a new thing, and he shot a disc in and he said, I said, well, what are you doing with that? Oh, he says, that's going down into your computer. And he took it out and put it in his top pocket inside about five months. I said, well, what was all that about? And he says, well, there's brand new viruses and so on that are coming out. And he says, that, that'll deal with it. So the existing one that has been working for just a year or so, that, that, that can't deal with it. No, that can't deal with it. That hasn't been about it. It's a new situation, new problem, you see, there isn't. And the old can't manage it. You need something new. And brothers and sisters tonight, you don't need me to remind you that there's a renewed manifestation of wickedness and ungodliness upon the nation and in the heavens and in the realm of the demonic and that which is, is just permeating our society. There is a new situation in the land and there has to be a new raised up by God to deal with it. The uniqueness of the situation. Because the old was obsolete. You see, what I'm concerned about is God has been stirring my spirit in recent days and weeks. God has been really handling me and really handling my wife in a way that perhaps he hasn't done for years. And what God has been showing us is, is, is so much that the old, the, the church, the evangelical church at large, is entrenched in the past. She's in the past. She's living there, she wants to be there, she'll pray to be there, but she'll not be moved. She doesn't want to be moved. She wants to live in a past generation where God moved through different people and she wants that again. But God said, no, a new thing. A new thing. Not the old thing, a new thing. And God says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make thee a new. Now I want you to notice that God is not going to do a new thing only, but he says, I'm going to do a new thing in you, in this remnant. I'm going to do something in there. The old is obsolete. I went in last week to buy oranges in the shop. I picked up the little bag to take them home, but I rejected them. I threw them down again. The first reason was they were unattractive. There's nothing attractive about them when I saw the colour of the men behind the little orange bag. There's no way I was going to eat them. 
And secondly, whenever I looked at them, I saw one who turned green. You know, somebody's, they get them hidden in behind the green one. And I realized that, that these oranges, they've lost their usefulness. Oh yes, they're put on the market, they're for sale. If you want to buy them, they're there. That's, that's what's being presented. That's what we have to offer, but it's no use. And brothers and sisters, in relation to the extent of the need in the land tonight, the spiritual need of Ireland, what we have on offer is not able to deal with the situation. We have like rotten oranges sitting on the counter, but it's no use. It's no use. And that's why the Lord says, Behold, I will make thee a new, a necessary new thing, a fresh thing. God explained that same truth to Jeremiah. He told the prophet to go and to buy a band of linen in white. And he bought the band of linen and he put it on himself. And the Lord said to him, wear it. And he wore it for a while. God says, don't wash it. And then the Lord said, I want you to go and hide it in a rock somewhere. And he went and he hid it in a rock and he covered it with soil. And God said, leave it there. And he went about his business. And after many, many days, the Lord said, Jeremiah, go back. Go back and dig that out again. And he dug it out and it was all decayed and rotted. And it was black and filthy. And he went and the Lord said to him, that is Israel. This is Israel. She has nothing to offer anymore. She's nothing to present. She's full of filth. She's full of sin. She's full of backsliding. I can't handle her. I need a new thing. A new thing. Very quickly, there's the necessity. He said, I will make thee a new sharp, sharp threshing instrument. Speaks of agony. Agony. To be sharp meant to be active, to be determined, to be pointed on the cutting edge. Brothers and sisters, you can be anywhere in the Lord's work, but you need to be on the cutting edge for the Lord. On the cutting edge. You see, in Ecclesiastes we read, if the, sun, if, if the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. You see, whenever you take an iron or a slap on hook as we have at home or a hatchet, and, and you start to use that thing and it's blunt, it's been lying there in, in, in a shed for ages, it's rusted over, the end's blunted, it hasn't been used for a long time, but it was used in the past, but it hasn't been now for a long time. And you take that thing, you can swing it. You can do everything you want with it, but you, you don't have a cutting edge, and that's where we are in the church. No cutting edge, but plenty of swinging, no amount of activity, no shortage of this, that, and that, but no cutting edge, no impact. And so then God says, I'm going to make it sharp. It has to be sharp, it's no good blood. And you and I, we need to be sharp. And listen, the denomination won't make you sharp. Your minister won't make you sharp. The pastor won't make you sharp. Only Christ can make you sharp. Only the Holy Ghost filling you and controlling you can make you sharp. Nothing else. No matter where you go to or what you experience, unless Christ is all in all and He fills and thrills you, you'll never be sharp. You see, it was agony for that little hatchet. Do you imagine if it had a real life inside it, that little bit of steel? And it's taken out and it's set down on the bench. And the man takes the file or the rasp and he starts cutting. Oh, that's sore. Oh, don't keep cutting at me. Oh, yes, but I've got to get edges off you. Oh, but this is sore. Don't keep doing it. Yeah, it's got to keep happening. Something I have learned over the years, I often say to Rachel sometimes, concerning what God has for us in the future, I've often said, if I had known the amount of filing that God would have to have done in my life, I don't think I could have even went into the Lord's work. If I only knew what God was going to do with me and do through me and do on me. But it's sharpening. It's sharpening. And listen, even the disappointments, even the discouragements, even the bad things. We know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Well, 
there was pain. Remember, I was a lad at home on the farm. My father used to take what was called a slap and cut the hedges and slap and And every so often he would stop and he would take out a stone out of his pocket and he would start fighting that thing, sharpening it up. Sharpening it up. Are you letting God sharpen you? Listen, not everybody's going to be in this. Not all the saints are going to be the new threshing instrument for what God's going to do in this land. Not going to take off. There's going to be a lot of evangelicals left behind. They're not in the Spirit. They're not walking in the Spirit. They're not living in the Spirit. They're not praying in the Spirit. And God's going to leave them behind. And most likely when God does work, they'll become the greatest opponents of it. Because it has shattered the old. Well, there's, there's pain. Keep fighting the edge, cutting it off, getting it sharpened. What, what are you knocking out? Knocking things off you that need knocked off. Lord, what are you knocking out of us? Well, let me tell you some of the things that God knocked out of my life, and he's, he's still sharp. God learns to knock out prejudice out of us. Doctrinal prejudice. Denominational prejudice. A thousand prejudices. And they're from the pit. They're from the pit. And they're encased by Satan. He builds upon them. He uses them to get the people of God against each other. To turn all their weaponry on one another. And what a job he has done in Ulster. What a job. But brothers and sisters, prejudice. When God puts the file on you by the Holy Ghost and by his word. And you get alone with him and you open your heart to him. God will deal with that. Sectarianism. God will deal with sectarianism in your soul. From whatever form, whether it be in the land or whether it be in the church. Criticism. Hardness. Judging without knowledge of the situation. Hypocrisy. It goes on and on. I don't know all that God has to do with me yet. But I'm open for the fire. I'm open for what God wants to do. I'm tired of the old. I'm tired of what's going on today in Ulster. Everybody's telling me about what God's doing and what God's working. Dear friends, it's nothing for what God's going to do and what needs to be done. There needs to be a new day. And I'm clinging to God for it. I'm clinging to God for I see nothing in the old that will bring the people of Ireland to God. There's an agony. You see, there was a pain involved, and not only that, friends, there was a purity. You ever see an old axe that hadn't been used covered in rust? See what I mean? File it. Shines like a pen. Cleans a whistle. And there's the people. Holding the song of the Lord. Filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the need to me. Holding the song of the Lord. Not false holiness. Not the movement of holiness. Not holiness churches. But genuine heart. We have so much sham in the land. So much emptiness. All of us are, all names, all titles, everything written out and everybody's name hid behind. And God is looking for people that would just give themselves wholly to Him and say, Lord, just use me. Lord, just find me, just prepare me, just do something through me. It requires purity. He says, I will make thee a new, sharp, threshing instrument. Have and take Authority. I remember many years ago listening to a tape. It never ceases to move me every time I listen to it. The late Leonard Raven Hill. He, he prayed in that tape. It was a tape called Abraham and Isaac. Some of you may have it. Had it. And man, how, how he prays and how he weeps before God as he calls on God for the need of America. And one of the things that, that he expressed and his heart was so burdened, he says, Lord, the church has no authority. She has no authority. And there she has. She's frightened. She's intimidated. She depends on politicians to win her day. That's where we are. No authority in the church. Listen, in the early church, they had nothing, just God. They had no money. They had no church buildings, they had, they, had no, they, had no, they had nothing, they had just God, and they moved. 
the place. We have everything but God. That's where we are. I could be misunderstood preaching with this tonight, but maybe evangelical people and they're here, or maybe some listening to a tape or video say, what are you talking about? You're opposing to No, 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 no. We're just talking about another level. Amen. Just talking about another level. I'm not opposed to what's going on in the church today. I'm not opposed to God's people. I love God's people. But I know we're not where we could be. I know where we're not where God wants us to be. We're deluded living in death. I'm supposing I'm being told that it's life and it's death. That's the problem. Authority. It was a sleigh or a sleigh that was pulled behind beast, a couple of foot deep of, of straw and, and the grain and the chaff all in together. And the old, this little device would be on the back of the wire and it would just, just wind around and it had big teeth in it. And it would just beat into that and it would, it would beat the, the chaff away from the, away from the corn and it would break the straw. It was just, it was just eating everything behind it. And the Lord says, that's what I'm going to make you like. A sharp, threshing instrument having teeth. The Lord says that the weapons of our warfare are not kind of but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know, there's an interesting verse in, in Luke 10 and verse 19. It says there, Jesus said to the disciples, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Two powers, but they're not the same power. They're different. Behold, I give unto you power is exousia. It means authority. A policeman. If I stepped out in the road tonight and put up my hand, people would drive over me. They'd probably be entitled to do that. But if I was a policeman and had the uniform on, I would have the authority of the police to stop that vehicle. That's what God says. Behold, I give unto you authority. The authority of the name of Jesus. The power of Jesus. He said, I give that to you. What does the church know tonight of using authority? I give you authority, power, to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power, dunamis, the, the ability of the enemy, everything that hell can concoct, everything the devil can maneuver, everything. God says, I've given you authority over that ability of hell. Nothing that hell can present, nothing that hell can do can beat you. You have authority. And if you don't, hell will beat you. Hell will trap over you. And hell will intimidate you. Authority. What kind of authority? He says to thresh. It means to trample. To break to pieces. Break to pieces what? He says the mountains. Beat them small and shall make the hills as chaff. Mountains speaks of potentates, kings, principalities. The hills are the little princes. I give, what did he say in Ephesians 6? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness. God says, I'll make you a new sharp threshing instrument. I'll beat them down. Oh, I'll beat them down. Praise. And God will beat them down. He said to them in these beautiful verses, he says, Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be shamed. They shall be as nothing. They shall strive with thee. They that strive shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shall not ever find them. Can you imagine such a day where the powers of darkness that, that restrain us in prayer, that prevent us from getting the victories we long for, and is that those, those, those powers, can you imagine that those powers are broken down as a mountain is turned to dust? God says that's what will happen with the new, this new thing, this new sharp threshing instrument. It's going to beat that kind of mountain out of the way. As we conclude, what does God say will come of it? Well, He says, You'll beat them small and shall make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them. Listen to it as we finish. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away. I remember working on the farm at home. The summertime in the middle of July, perhaps, you would have had a field with rows of hay waiting for the baler to come and bail it up. And a little whirlwind would just come down. And you would just see just a little lump of hay that would just lift up and you just stand there and watch it and it would just go 
way up into the heavens, spinning around, and it would just disappear. Frequently saw that on the farm. A little whirlwind. You see, if the wind doesn't blow, then you can't beat the thresh, thresh the corn from the chaff. You need the wind. And here's this beautiful promise from the Lord. The Lord said, listen, I'm, I'm going to do this in you. If, you. if you'll just cooperate with me, if you'll do what I ask you to do, if you'll learn to walk with me, if you open yourself to me and let the Spirit of God control you and teach you, God says, I will make you a sharp, a new sharp threshing instrument. And God says, when you start moving, my wind will be moving as well. And God says, whenever you start threshing down over the enemies of God and over the mountains and the potentates and the enemies of God, God says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send my wind. And my wind is going to blow on that which you have taken authority over. And God says, it's going to blow away. And God says, not only will I send the wind, he says, but I will to carry them away. But he says, then I will, carry, I will send the whirlwind and scatter them. The enemies of God. The enemies in the heavens. The enemies to this land. The enemies to the salvation in the south of Ireland of the children. All the spirit spiritual enemies under that monster sin. God says I will raise up a new sharp threshing instrument and I let go of my wind and I will blow them away. Well I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to I'm keeping my eye and my heart before the Lord for to see the Lord raising up the new thing and the new people and the stirring of those whom God's Spirit will stir. And what happens whenever this wind blows and it all happens? Well, we conclude with this. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. God says, I bring joy. And of course that happened. It was fulfilled liberally because when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dreamed. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. And they said, The Lord hath done great things for us. Whereof we are glad. Brothers and sisters, I believe with all my heart that there's a covenant of change. A covenant of change. God is going to raise up a new thing. And by that new thing, under the control of his blessed spirit, he will deal with his enemies. May God help you and I to be part of that music. Let's bow in prayer. Now, gracious God, we pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, thou would take thy word and do all that thou dost want to do with it and send it everywhere you want to send it. Oh, Father, again, we tell you in this little hall tonight, we, thy people, shall be willing in the day of thy power. We await, Lord, patiently the day of thy power. Give us grace to stay in the gap. Give us help to keep praying. Give us grace to face every opponent. And take authority over them. Amen. In Jesus' name.
Then, O oh God, send thy wind. Amen. The wind of God. The wind of heaven. The wind from the throne. The whirlwinds from above. And oh, bring rejoicing again. And salvation. To our land. Hear us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.